Hello, welcome to Agri Today on Erosin Television, Mabushi Abuja, Nigeria. My name is Kadija Oluwa Toin. I mean, on today's episode of the program, we will be taking a look at the emerging trends in agriculture. And to uh, discuss that with us uh, on this episode is no other person than Professor Akim Abolade Oyeride, who is the Dean of Agriculture, University of Abuja. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, agriculture, as uh, majority of uh, people usually take it, we take it as uh, farming, which is uh, the distant way of uh, doing uh, the practice. But uh, uh, based on uh, being in the 21st century, there are so many dynamics in the, the practice of agriculture that is uh, devoid of the use of cutlass and O, which uh, is traditional in uh, Africa. The global trends that is happening to agriculture now has changed with the adoption of uh, modern techniques and uh, the use of uh, uh, information and communication technology to foster and develop modernity in agriculture. Because you will have asked me that uh, why are the young, young ones, the youth and the women, why are they running away from practicing agriculture? They are because uh, the agriculture that they inherited traditionally is highly laborious and uh, it's unattractive to the younger ones to engage in. The import of that means that uh, no youth will want to engage in the agriculture of using cutlass and oil and axe and a host of other. So recently in the, in the world now, starting from the uh, Sustainable Development Goal, which identify uh, food security, as the number second, the, the number two agenda as regards uh, SDG, that's Sustainable Development Goal of the United Nations, realize that uh, there cannot be food without having adequate agricultural engagement and modernized ways of uh, practicing agriculture. So with that trend, any scheme of agriculture, because when you talk about agriculture, you talk about uh, starting from a crop production, uh, um, plant production, up to when you get to livestock production or animal production, up to forestry, up to fishery and aquaculture, up to the maritime where we talk about the, uh, the blue economy of uh, ocean, the seas and the lake. So each and every one of them, even up to forestry engagement too, each and every one of them have something to do with uh, production of food and raw material for industry. It means without agriculture, the, the world will not have adequate raw material for most of our industry and there will be no food for us. And if there's no food, like the Agenda 2063 of uh, AU, that's the African Union, talks about food affordability, food availability for the populace. Because uh, the projection is that uh, Africa will take close to half of the population of the world by 2050. And we must look for how do we feed, how do we produce food for this massive, geometrically growing population. That was what led to the new innovation in the emerging trends in how agriculture is being practiced. Agriculture that is being practiced as rudimentary at subsistence level, there is a, a, a great divergence now where we are now thinking of using modern techniques. The major problem, like what I said in one of uh, a program, is that uh, People usually think agri uh, when you talk about modern agriculture, they will be thinking of tractorization of the field. There's difference between tractorization and the use of technology in agricultural production. The agricultural value chain starts from input production up to the, the, what we call in the concept of farm to fork. That means from the farm, that means from the input section 
up to the food gets to your table for consumption. That's the farm to fork concept. So, which means you cannot have a, an enabling agricultural production without taking care of adequately of the farm to fork concept. You start from the input provider. How are we enabling? How are we assisting the input provider using the modern techniques? Like, uh, for example, the input provider that want to have fertilizer, agrochemical, seed, and the host. How can they assess it using their cell phone? How can they access information about that being uh, getting facility throughout the world? So, you, from there you go into production. The production is when you now talk about any form of agricultural engagement that you want to go into. How do you modernize the practice? How do you use the Internet of Things? Internet of Things means how do you use robots and a host of other things to, to engage, to reduce the use of uh, manpower and uh, the drudgery that is involved in agricultural production. So it means that when you have such a technique, it can be intermediate technology. It's not compulsory, it must be big tractor. It's not compulsory that it must be big processing outfit. It, what you, it, the ordinary drying of the commodity alone will boost and improve what will be the market value of what we are producing. So the trend is one, you take it from that, you take it to the production level. How do you ease the production technique that the farmer can use so that the youth and the, the, the upcoming generation and the women that are a little bit uh, weak can engage in productive agriculture? After that, you move from that to processing. Most of the processing that we are doing now, if you are traveling all over Nigeria during the, the production uh, season, we are losing close to over 50% of our commodity to post harvest losses because we have not enabled how do we preserve, how do we process the commodity that we are producing. And that's why you have glut. When you talk about glut, means majority of people, we have commodity and most of our agricultural commodity are perishable, whether they are animal or plant or fishery product, they are highly perishable. So with that, when they are perishable, it means that the microorganism and insect and a host of others can quickly destroy those commodities. So with that, it means we must have a way in which we can quickly reduce the, uh, the moisture content, in which we can easily add value to whatsoever we are producing as a commodity. So the processing outfit starts from as small as Additional of salt, addition of salt, as much as reduction in the moisture content, as much as that. So there are small, small uh, tools that we can engage in doing that. Instead of drying, because the practice now is that you see people drying their product on the road, on the quota. When, when they are drying the product on the quota, some remnant of stone gets into it. And by the time you are now eating your beans, by the time you are taking some of the maize and a host of other, you'll be, you'll be consuming some uh, pebbles of, uh, of uh, stone, which is highly hazardous to human health. So what it means is that you, you must engage in, flash, in the use of flash drying techniques, the use of uh, solar techniques, the use of good hygiene that will produce food commodity that is highly safe. There's a difference between food security and food safety. So when you talk about food safety, it means you now have food commodity that is highly, that is good for consumption, that will not cause any health hazard. After that, you move to the next level. After processing, you go into storage. We are housing. So within the warehousing, you can have the same set of techniques that where you use the chips, the sensor, that gives adequate information about what are the condition of what is being stored. So, so that there, if there is prevention of a uh, pest and disease uh, incidents, you can quickly curtail that and reduce the post-harvest losses. 
most of our farmers lose most of what they are producing to pathogen and pest. And with that, if you now have, you are now using a modern ways of storage, like the silo, like uh, the, 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 the use of a, a flash dryer and the use of a cold, uh, cold storage technique. For example, if you are producing fish, you store it under a cool system. Some of them, you even store them under a temperature that is below 2 degrees Celsius. Depend on which commodity are you storing. There are some of them that you store in a, in a medium of like nitrogen and a host of other. So that by the time you are having that, you still have a safe commodity that can be consumed easily. So after storage, you go into the market. How do we market our agricultural commodity now? We market our agricultural commodity based on hope. That's the way we market. The farmer carries, uh, is either the farmer sell at the farm gate at ridiculous price, or the farmer takes it to the closest uh, market within the range of the village, or the town, or the community. And by the, in the evening, before the farmer, because the farmer knows that uh, the commodity is perishable, the farmer will, will, will find it difficult, highly difficult, to take back the commodity home. Maybe the farmer spends some money in all age before getting to the market. And getting to the market, whatsoever they price that commodity late in the evening, the farmer will, will even sell it at a loss. So after selling it at a loss, what we end up doing is that it means the farmer is producing at a cost, at a value that is below production rate. So which means that majority of our farmers in Nigeria are producing at a loss because they don't have uh, the closest medium that can add value, maybe process into other forms, or that can add value to the commodity they are producing. So with that, farmer will be selling their commodity at a ridiculous price. But for venture that the farmer is making use of uh, the, um, the uh, information and communication technology, where you can use your phone, where you can sell online, where you can uh, advertise your commodity online, the, such a farmer can gain access to both local and the international market. So with that, it means the farmer will have access to having his commodity all uh, being highly competitive. Apart from using the comparative advantage, the farmer will produce a highly competitive commodity that can gain access to any market in the world. It means that if I'm producing in Abuja here, as poor as Abaji, as Ogwagwalada or Kwali, most of my buyers all over the world can assess, can view, can see my, the, the, my productivity, can, especially if the organic product sells more, can come in, can give a call, can send a message, and, I, and he or she will arrange for how the commodity can get to any part of the world. So with that, the farmer will be able to maximize the return on investment and have economic gain from his productivity. I, I wanted to shed a bit light on some of these um, technologies uh, uh, that is there in that put into uh, you know uh, agriculture these days. There are some some uh, soil sensor, vertical farming, aerial imaging, and all that. Some people they will tell you it's not just to farm here. Let me just till the ground and then put in my tuber and then uh, voila the the and all that. Mm -hmm. So. How important are all of these techniques in the modern day farming? Nowadays, the practice of agriculture is beyond soil. Because we now have what we call soilless agriculture. Where you can have aeroponic, hydroponic, vertical farming, even farming in bags. Majority of people don't even wait to plant their yam in situ on the field. Most of the people plant their yam in bags now, and it still have the same productivity. The fact remains that the world has emerged beyond the traditional practice of agriculture. In yam production, there is what we call mini set technique, where you can have one tuber producing close to about uh, 
about minimum of about 100 minisets that you can transplant and take to the field. That's, those are the part of the emerging trend. Instead of cutting one to buy into two or three, and such a farmer will be producing at a loss. Such can be used to do mini setting where you have multitude of them. Tissue culture is another technique. If you want to have a banana, a pineapple, soccer, and a host of others, you can have a plantlet in a tissue culture lab where you produce millions of plantlets. Because you know at that level, you are talking about tissue culturing. You are talking about working at a tissue level. The other one is the one that where you use genome, gene editing. That's the biotechnology option. Where you use the gene editing, where you extract only the gene, only the cell of that gene, and you can grow. You can produce commodity, you can produce agricultural product using just the cell. You have the cell, you grow such a cell in a medium on, or in a media that supports the growth where all the nutrient requirements will be supplied. But the present thing in the world now is precision agriculture or what we call precision farming. Because we have found out that there is a great waste in agricultural productivity. People that apply fertilizer are wasting it. People that apply organic manure are wasting it. People that apply water are wasting it. That is what led to the use of uh, what we call drip irrigation system. If you go, the type of irrigation system that was being used before is sprinkling, the use of sprinkler. This use of sprinkler will waste so much water and the water will get to even weeds and weeds will start growing. But in a drip irrigation system, it's like taking the drip when somebody is sick and you're in the hospital and they insert the drip and it will be going, the dropping, tum, small after the other. So in the drip irrigation system concept, you can supply nutrients as a liquid fertilizer. You can supply the, 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 the pesticide and the, uh, the pesticide. You can supply the one that will treat the pathogen within the water system that goes into the drip. For example, if you want to control a nematode now. Nematode, most of the time, they are in the soil and they affect the, the, the root of the crop. If you have that such a solution that you now introduce it into the water, to the liquid that gets to that plant, such a problem will be solved directly because the root picks it up and the plant can utilize that. So in precision agriculture, we don't want people to guess that if I want to plant, I, it's MPK 15, 15, 15. Why did you want to use 15, 15, 15? Have you tested your soil? Do you know which nutrient is deficient? It is only the nutrient that is deficient that you supply. What is the water requirement for your plant? Water requirement for plant varies. The legume, the fruits, the, 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 the grains, and a host of other. Each one, you must first of all identify what is the actual water requirement for them. After knowing that, you will now produce optimally. You supply optimally for them. It is when those plants have that, that you will not have leaching, you will not have erosion. So in precision farming, it takes care of the precise problem of a particular location of a particular plant at a particular time. It means you maximize productivity if you give efficient, like a, a, in an animal, in human being, we said balanced diet or balanced nutrition. So in plant two, there's balanced diet. Some of them need more of phosphorus. Some of them need more of the living vegetable needs more of nitrogen. Some of them need more of potassium. It's not that when they need iron, you are now giving them phosphorus. With that, they will not do well. So in precision agriculture, you, 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 you identify. That's why most of the people in that practice agriculture usually have lost. Because majority doesn't follow the SOP, safety operation procedure of production. For example, they will not do soil tests to even know which nutrient is deficient.
Th that's why, apart from not, from not doing that, they will not even uh, identify what is in the water that they want to use. For example, some water have high salt that will destroy the plants. So all these things, these are things you have to be certain ways. And most of the people that use, uh, you don't, like what I used to tell people, you don't need to have one hectare. You don't need to have a, a, an acre to do agriculture. Agriculture is beyond that now. You can have as small as this room where we are, and you have a vertical farming, you can be producing your grasses. You can have a mini greenhouse. You, when you talk about greenhouse, you can have temperature that we call a uh, pseudo temperature. For example, if the plant that I want to be producing needs just 10 degrees Celsius, I should be able to reduce the temperature of that greenhouse to 10 degrees Celsius and I'll be producing my lettuce and cabbage optimally, even apple, as if I'm in the, uh, in the trop, uh, temperate region. That is the same reason why they said, uh, some people reported that uh, in China, they are now planting some of our tree crops. They are now planting yam and a host of others like that. Because they have synchronized and now get what are the growth requirements for those commodities. That is what you call precision agriculture. So that by the time you have that, you will, be, you will not be engaging in waste of the resources that is scarce. Because the resources in agricultural production is scarce. And if you are now wasting it, that you are now doing guesswork to go and buy to go and buy fertilizer that is not required. You have a fertilizer instead of buying a urea and a host of other that will give a nitrogen. You are now putting NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So these are things that is part of the emerging thing. So the vertical farming, the hydroponic, aeroponic, and a host of other. In some of countries like Japan. They do their, some of their practice, or most of their stadium, instead of wasting, uh, wasting resources, they, 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 they deck it up and they are doing planting there. The concept of urban farming at the balcony, you see them producing, you see them pan, uh, planting at the balcony. When I was in Marrakesh, in uh, Morocco, most of the roundabout in Marrakesh, they are using it to plant vegetables and other commodities. And when I asked them the question, they said, ah, don't you know that we import soil to plant? But in Nigeria, we are so fortunate that uh, even if you decide to throw away any of your seed, it will start growing and it will be giving you fruits without taking care. In Israel, they paint most of their fruits with white color so that they will not desiccate. But we, God that we usually, most of the time, we say God is a Nigerian. Because most of what we are planting, we don't take care of them. We don't give maximum, but they still produce for us to sustain us. But if, per adventure, we can now go into precision farming, into modernizing our practice and using emerging trends, using the emerging uh, techniques, emerging technology in agricultural production, Nigeria can f successfully feed Africa. The Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria ASCN coordinates the activities of research institutes and is responsible for supervision, regulation, coordination of research activities and programs of higher institutions in Nigeria. I'm Professor Hamidou Sharabatusin's assumption as Executive Secretary of ARCN in April 2020 has solidified the transformation of agriculture in Nigeria through strategic and meaningful execution of research fundings for improvement of the agricultural sector. The Agricultural Research Council of Nigeria is wearing a new look on that stewardship of Professor Garba Hamidou Sharabatu, who says, alone. I am nothing, but together I am something. A failure to achieve the aims and objectives of this government is our collective failure. So it's left for us not to disgrace them, not to disappoint them, and by implication, disappoint the federal government. A 
RCN promoting agriculture. If we want to thrive on this planet, we must completely reimagine agriculture and food production. As a futurist, I help companies and industries understand the future trends and the impact of technology and, and how societies are, are, are changing. And basically, to feed this growing global population, there are estimates that we will have to increase food production by as much as 68% by 2050. We are also seeing an increase in the middle class population across the world, which usually means an increased demand for meat. These are huge challenges for our already struggling planet. The food system overall accounts for up to 26% of total global greenhouse gas emissions. So let's look at some of the key trends that will help us reimagine the entire ecosystem of agriculture and food production. For me, the first one is that we need to reimagine farming and the farming methods we use. Um, new farming methods could help industry reduce its environmental impact while still increasing productivity. We've seen previous evolutions in farming that have largely been driven by mechanical improvements, namely bigger and better machinery or genetic advances like better seed or more effective fertilizers. The next big transformation is being driven by digital tools. For example, we have automation, including the use of robots, drones and autonomous tractors that make farming more efficient. We also have precision farming, which involves applying irrigation, fertilizers and pesticides at variable rates only where and when it is actually needed. The other key trends to watch in farming methods include a more localized urban farming, so for example food uh, being produced closer to where people need it and will buy it and theref therefore reducing food miles. There's a big move towards vertical farming, the practice of growing crops in vertical layers and hydrophonics, which is growing plants in nutrient-rich water. Both of these use much less water, soil and space than traditional field farming methods. And hopefully all of them will help us to make farming and food production more productive and more sustainable. The second big trend that I'm seeing is that we need to find different ways to produce food and especially meat. If you think about this, one third of croplands around the world are used to grow feed for livestock rather than feed humans. And the obvious and simplest solution would be to, for us all to move to a plant-based diet. And actually removing meat and dairy from our diet is the single most impactful way for you to reduce your environmental impact. The challenge obviously is that meat and dairy is ingrained in so many cultures and it's I think naive to believe that we'll all switch to become vegan. So one option that I'm seeing or two options, one is cultured or lab, lab grown meat that I think is really important and then there's a big movement towards plant-based meats. So for example Burger King now has plant-based burgers on their menu, many restaurants are moving towards that. And we've seen this with this massive um, IPO of, of plant-based pioneer um, Beyond Meat that went public for $1.5 billion and then three months later was, was valued at over $13 billion. So in fact, estimates suggest that meat alternatives could account for, uh, for around 10% of the global meat industry by 2029. 
The other big thing I'm really excited about is cultured meat, which basically is genetically exactly the same as real meat, but it is produced from animal cells. Um, real meat, for me, without the factory farms and animal slaughter sounds like a pretty good idea. So it's still early days for this industry, but in 2020, Singapore became the first nation to approve cultured meat for sale. And I think 3D printing has also a role to play in food production. For example, Barcelona-based startup Nova Meat has already successfully created the world's first 3D printed piece of meat that apparently mimics the fibrous nature of real meat. 3D printing also allows us to personalize our food. Sushi Singularity, a restaurant in Tokyo, has the goal of basically 3D printing our sushi using cultured meat and other ingredients to create food that is nutritionally exactly catered for our needs. Fortunately, you are from uh, Agri Research Council, and Agri Research Council has uh, most of the research agencies, research institutes, as well as the University of Agriculture in Nigeria, have been managed by the Executive Secretary of Agri Research Council. So, most of the time, what I used to say is that uh, we are not helping our farmer. We leave them to having uh, hope in, uh, uh, let's say, hope that is not certain because the, the farmer will keep uh, assisting themselves. The reason is this. We have research uh, institutes all over Nigeria. We have research institutes, I can keep naming them, starting from uh, uh, NCRI, Badegi, Nispri, Nilorni, uh, Firo, uh, Firo is not under ARCN, that's uh, Umudike, that's uh, Root and uh, uh, Root Crop uh, Research Institute, Umudike, and uh, National Mechanization in uh, Income, and a host of others like that, just to mention a few. The, the most, all the, the mandate of those research institutes is to make agric easy for our farmers. And the research institute engages in doing, so, they are doing so much. It, they are more or less like the universities, like the Faculty of Agri, where I am now, where we have seven departments here. Research, uh, res, uh, researches are going on. But the outcome of this research, are we using them? That's the issue. Majority of the research 
in Nigeria, whether in the research institute or in the university, most of us in the university use them for promotion, as well as people in the research institute. But the main aim of the mandate that led to our establishment, that is not what we should to be using it for. The mandate is whatsoever we produce, whatsoever finding, whatsoever innovation that we have, we should take it to the grassroots, to the community. So the way forward is we should stop the issue of uh, doing research for promotion or research for uh, to just uh, to enhance or to boost our ego. We should be thinking of uh, highly innovative research that will do one. The first one is to solve problem of the farmer, to make it easy for them in their practice. That's the first one. The second one is to have uh, researches that can be dovetailed, that can be that can solve the problem of uh, the, the 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 industry, small scale and large scale industry. Most of it, uh, there was a year that uh, we have some of our, 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 our companies in Nigeria that are importing our agricultural commodity from other countries. It's as bad as that. The grains like uh, maize, like, uh, like uh, the, uh, there was a time Indonesia was bringing red oil to us here. Cameroon was bringing... Uh, um, Honey, the shea butter is being brought by by people in Ghana, and Nigeria has the highest number of shea shea tree in the world. And the processed shea butter is coming from Ghana, you so that you can see the the, the, the paradoxical ideology of it. The yam, majority of the, as at now, Ghana is exporting yam to, to the to the to the United Kingdom now. Nigeria still produce, we are the highest producer of yam in the world. So these are, you, you just see it as an irony that what is wrong with us? So, and the best and the easiest way is how do we assist this farmer? Some time ago we have a functional agricultural development projects across board in Nigeria. Sometimes we have Fadama 3, now we have uh, AF Fadama. That's an additional fund, Fadama. That's the present one that we have now. But what are they doing? What are they doing? What they do is that they, they take information about agricultural research and development to the rural area, to the villages. But since, AD, since uh, World Bank stopped funding ADP, it collapsed. Even Fadama 3, is, the AF Fadama 3 is only for selected states now is not all states in Nigeria. So the only way out is for the local governments and the state government to own agricultural practice. Because they are the closest to the farmer, they are the closest to the rural area. If uh, paraventure when I traveled to India, to Israel, to China, and a host of other countries like that that I've been to. I find out that the rural area is better than the urban city. They have good roads, they have good water, they have solar panel for electricity. So the even the younger ones are not willing to come to, to this to the city because the life in the in the villages, the life in the countryside is better than the life in the city. Even in uh, in uh, in uh, Beijing, you cannot buy a land in Beijing unless you go and buy in your city. It's expensive. They make it no. It's not attractive. It's not like what is happening in Abuja that everybody, every family want to be in Lagos, Abuja, Port or Kano, and everybody is living their community that is highly productive. So the, the fact remains that what the government is supposed to do is to focus on more. We have a DFRI sometime, sometime ago in Nigeria where DFRI was doing the rural roads. If a farmer knows that if I want to leave Abaji or Goyin 
in uh, Guagualada, there's a place called Goin, Guagualada, that within 10, 15 minutes, I'll get to the city to come and save my commodity. Such a person, such a farmer will not stay in the city. It's not advisable because there is more, there is more to life when you are in the villages. There is more to life when you are in your innate commodity, uh, community. If you have ever stayed in the village, you know that life in village is very interesting, very sweet. You eat fresh fruit, fresh commodity, you live fresh life, you have a good ear, not that uh, you'll be in Potter Court and you have suit, and you'll be healing suit and a host of industrial waste. So the fact remains that the people at the local government and the state level should hone up and take development of agriculture. That's one. Two, all the research institutes should make sure that they have their tentacle, they have their presence. We have just about 774 local government thereof, if I'm right, in Nigeria. Each local government should have presence of people that can assist them. If you have traveled, when I did the work for FAO on action against desertification, what shocked me most was when we got to when we got to uh, Alagarino. Alagarino is in Bashi State. Alagarino, Shakoto, um, Shakoto is in um, uh, that's after Deja in uh, Jigawa State. Eleya uh, or something like that in Sokoto and the host of others. You find out you have the presence of the white people. All this from the United Nations, WHO, and the host of others. You see they are present in those communities. These are communities that you drive for four or five hours in. That you will not even you will not even see a road. You just be driving. I even ask the driver that where are you taking? Hope you are not kid that time kidnapping is not so rampant like this. Where are you taking us to? But when we got there, we see the presence of the foreigner, the funding partners. They are there, developing those communities. And we as a nation don't have present our adp our father our afds did not have presence there okay. fao is an international group they are the one that gave the job that uh, make me to do that we covered about uh, nine states is the, the great green wall uh, project of the ministry of environment as well they are involved so you now look at it that we that we are the owner of the country that we own the country have deserted our people Whereas the foreigners are coming. Some foreigners even know our community better than us because they don't fear. They go there and they have at the back of their mind that they want to assist. But we that we are engaged in agricultural development prefer staying in the city. And we'll be doing our agricultural development on our tables and shares. And the people that we say we are assisting, we don't get to them, we don't assist them, we don't talk to them, they don't know us. Why would they not be selling their commodity to the foreigner like what they are doing with ginger in, uh, in um, Kaduna now? In Kaduna, majority of their ginger goes to, goes to China, India, and a host of others now. Instead of you having a country where we can take those ginger, add value to them, and now gain access to global market. To international market with that our farmer will have more return on from the sales of those commodities instead of selling at a ridiculous price so when i started i said there's difference between industry you have intermediate technology you have advanced technology the first thing the, the, because i will have throw a question back at you that why do we have olam in nigeria olam is an indian company most of our agro agricultural commodity, Ola mops it. And when they mop it, destroy it. After a while, they take it to China. We have so many of our commodity that has been mopped by foreigners. That's the bone of contention. Even the last report that I had was that they are even going to our Nigerian market now. Like in Kano and the host of others, they will now take all the commodity away. 
that when they take the commodity away, it will get to a stage, it will get to a stage that will not even have millet and sorghum to, for, to feed. Because the, the fact remains that it's not a case of industry. As far back as uh, 1985, the year of, we have what we call commodity board in Nigeria. The commodity board, what do they do? They mop up all the products from the farmer. When they mop it up, they will now go and store it so that farmer will not sell at ridiculous price. If we can go back there, the best thing we know how to do in Nigeria is to copy. We are copycats. If a state in Nigeria now said, I want to build, instead of waiting for federal government silo, I want to build storage facility for my grains, storage facility for my animal commodity, the cold room and a host of other storage, I want to be adding value to this. If we do that, our farmer will be producing maximally. During Obasanjo, Obasanjo said everybody should go and plant cassava. After planting cassava, President Obasanjo, after planting cassava, they did not they did not have plan for how will you they add value to it. Some of them, it got to the extent that the cassava that was on their field, majority of them could not approach it. They don't even have money to approach it because they said the, 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 the price is too ridiculous. Because everybody, well, if paraventure there is a medium to convert that uh, cassava to cassava chips, where you just dry it, you splice, you dry it, to gari, to flour, and most of other things like that. With that, you have added value to it. Do you know that the chalk that you are using as parastamol has a component of cassava in it? It's, a, it's an high, when, when they process it into powder, they now use that to mix the, the active ingredient of what works in the parastamol and the host of other pharmaceutical. But the major problem in, in Nigeria is that we don't want to make mistakes. We don't want... We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to start small. That's the problem we are having. We don't want to make mistakes. We don't want to start small. We, they, and, and any country, like uh, I remember in 2015 when I was in China, they said they are still doing, uh, they said they've not started innovation. That what they are still doing is imitation of the technology from US, from Canada, and their concept is that they send their children out, even in, uh, in Israel as well, they send their children out to go and understudy, develop world for six months. And it's compulsory, even India does that too, it's compulsory for them to come back home, to come and spend the remaining six months, to come and dovetail, to come and uh, download what they've learned. But majority of Nigeria that goes out, we, they will not come back because uh, the kind of responsibility we put on them is too much. Maybe they go out, they, we don't even think whether they have job or they don't have job. We'll just be asking, send to us, send this, send that. So they will not even feel safe to come home. So, but within that paravelia of concept, what it means is, we are not talking of gigantic uh, machine or gigantic uh, 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 companies. What we are saying, what I'm saying is, you need just small equipment, low technology to add value to whatsoever we are producing, just to change the form. For example, if you are drying, if you are able to dry your grains well, at the temperature below when insects and moles can affect it, your bean is the same thing. It means you can store it within six, seven months. The value of that commodity will be times two or times three of what the farmer will have sell it have been issue. So these are things that the, 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 if we have uh, people like what I said joining the Joneses and uh, bandwagon effect, immediately we have a state that just focus that, oh, because of my comparative advantage, I can produce grain very well, like, uh, like uh, sorghum, or millets. You now go to Nigerian beauty. Nigerian beauty, don't worry. Everything that you use to produce your malt, I can produce it for you. Just give me an enabling environment. I'll be supplying you so, so, so metric tons on this. How can you support me? That's all. But instead, even if we have grants, if we have money from outside Nigeria, we don't think of how that money will be used to develop 
the agricultural productivity. So it's not a rocket science. What we just need is to be conscious of it and to have, to have uh, to love this country and have the belief that we should. Each and every one of us need to contribute to the growth of the country. There is no country that is as blessed as Nigeria. On the note, we wrap it up on this episode of the program Agri Day. Join us again at the same time, same station next week. I am Kadija Uluwatu. Bye.